Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Manny Lagunas. You are watching Channel 4 News here on Bowie Films. A um, couple of new things happened today, not including uh, R. Kelly's trial. Um, Manny Lagunas has grown two inches since the last time we met. Uh, another big news, Bowie Films, the story of premieres season five. Check it out. And it says here, uh, Michael is still ugly. We're going to take it over to my friend, Michael Bowie, who was at the scene of the crime where this horrific accident has happened. Uh, Michael Bowie, can you give us more details on that? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Manny, for shooting it over to me. Uh, I noticed that you had a big stack of papers. I think that's way too big. You should probably use small note cards, maybe even post-it notes to put all your notes on whenever you're doing the, the review not all here. here in the not intro. All here. Uh, just, just a short thing, and then before we jump into it, just something, you know, just something real quick, real short, if I might say. Um, we have season five. Jay Davis here with us. This is going to be an exciting season an exciting episode an exciting path as we travel down the story of jay davis jay thank you for being here with us how are you today hey mike manny thank you so much for having me it's been a really productive day so far awesome awesome so your story is a unique one i only know bits and pieces so and and i know that the viewers know nothing about it so here we are we're about to jump into but before we jump into it we want to know who jay davis is so tell me just a little bit about you where are you from what was uh, like what kind of household did you grow in how grow up in what kind of siblings did you have how many brothers sisters etc tell us a little bit about you from that that earlier childhood so um, thanks again for having me, bro. Um, a lot of a lot of stuff uh, that you asked just then. So come from a really large family. Um, I have three sisters and a brother. So of course, one to five, a lot of mouths to feed, um, and a lot of activity in the house. Um, grew up in, a, I would consider it a broken home. Um, that wasn't necessarily there by age 18. Um, like a lot of the stories out of Detroit selling crack by 19, he was in prison. And that was a story in and out growing up. Um, so it wasn't necessarily present. So mom had really struggled to do what she had to do to make sure that there was food on the table, um, including that we got it, got it into school on time. She was there to pick stuff. So um, really just a pillar. Um, of course, made some <laughs> bad decisions to marry my pop, maybe. But, um, you know, she was really a pillar. So um, grew up Linwood Puritan over there, went to Thurgood Marshall Elementary. Um, a lot of people from around that way might know. Um, it was a tough area, to be honest. I remember hearing gunshots outside of my, my window quite quite regularly, just hoping and praying that, you know, none of those bullets come through my window. Remember, you know, our, our house, maybe two Christmases in a row, got broken into by the neighborhood crackhead, um, stole all our gifts and stuff, and it was just, you know, traumatizing. Man. But at the same time, it was character building because at that point, it was like, I knew that that's not what I wanted to see in my life. That's not what I wanted at the time where I thought if I were to have kids, you know, I, that's nothing I would want them to be around. And that's nothing I would want, any, you know, for anybody else. So, um, real struggle, you know, remember getting, you know, DTE shut off notices, you know, having to use the bathroom at the neighbors because the water shut off. So it was, it was a real hard time, but like I said, it, it, it defined character. So just, so just jumping in there, cause I, I thought that I miss, maybe I misheard you. You said your dad got locked up for drugs. So yeah, 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 yeah. So my father paternally, um, yeah, he did uh, sell a lot of drugs and was in and out of prison as that. So my mom remarried, um, remarried a man and that didn't necessarily work out. So she remarried third time's a charm, I'll say. Um, so she remarried to my stepdad who was a minister, who was a pastor and he, he preached everywhere. So um, I come from a, a, a priestly background or a lot of my family or our pastors, believe it or not. So, you know, you kind of mixed up. You got some drug dealers here. You got some pastors there, you know, who don't have, you know, a complex story in their family. Feel me? So, so we hear a lot about different people's stories and, you know, even from some of our past seasons about, you know, people either not having their fathers in their lives or their father being locked up in prison. Um, do you still talk to your dad, your, 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 yeah. first, your biological dad to this day? Yeah, so that's actually a developing story. Um, like I said, pretty uh, absent in my younger ages, but as an adult, 
it's like I felt like it was important to reestablish and go back and affirm like you know a lot of the mannerisms that I have a lot of the sometimes even the way that I laugh can sometimes be brought back to my dad and I felt like I can't as a man so, really move forward until I like you know uh, address that feeling if this is an ongoing story I kind of I, I'm, I was trying to cut you off because I don't if it's an ongoing story then I feel like we'll save that to kind of find out where that's at like um you know the last episode or towards the last episode of your season uh sure. just to kind of talk about what that's like but was he in your life in your childhood did you have a connection with him uh sparsely and sporadically present um he was doing his own thing you know like i said he had to make his own way uh and was in and out of jail so it's like yeah, not necessarily the most most present or, or, or one who made really good decisions unfortunately why didn't what other than being imprisoned i guess what made you say like hey that, that this is not for me because you know a lot of kids a lot of a lot of you know kids will look up to their parents as you know my hero and i want to be just like daddy i want to be a lawyer i want to be a cop i want to be a drug dealer what aside from being in prison made you say you know what as a young as a young kid made you say i don't want to be like my father i don't want to have this lifestyle that he's leading so I mean, like I said, radically present, but still there were moments where he was there. It was like, yeah, right. I, I remember, you know, him picking us up on a weekend or something like that when he could, or you know, like I said, trying to be as present as he could be. I mean, he was in and out of rough situations all the time. So um, and that it was still like there was when I was younger. Talking about I'm younger, like I'm not 27, uh, where there was like a lot of anger, a lot of animosity, a lot of hatred for my father for that absence. A lot of questions in myself, like would I be what I am if not? You know, and all these questions that most people would ask at an absent father, but it got to the point where it's like, hey, regardless of not, or whether he was present or not, my reality is it happened. So I can either choose to dwell in the absence or I could make it a priority to, you know, be as present as possible. So, so looking yeah. at the fact you're from Detroit, I'm from Detroit, it, it, we've had many people on here, just from just anyone that keeps up with the story of has seen the, the, the absence of fathers, not even just what I'm about to point out in terms of black men that mm. have fathers that, you know, kind of go to prison for whatever reason as prisons are, are over, overfilled with black men, uh, black people in general. My question is, what was life like with with different changes of different men coming into your life throughout your childhood? And not only, that, not only that, but your real biological father being absent in that picture while you're being introduced to new men. Um, I would say in a word, it, it brought a level of instability. Um, you don't really recognize it at the time. It's just like, it's your normal as a kid and the innocence as a kid it's just like even the gunshot even though you know it's like yeah it's just like all right tomorrow we're gonna go outside and play you know so it's like you become desensitized almost to whatever the environment it is no matter how rough it is so um i don't want to lose lose base but uh, remind me of the question so I, I was just curious what what it was like to have this uh, ever so changing different men coming into your life, um, you know, and then what it was like when you if you were somewhat exposed to your biological father, he's not in the picture and then new men are coming in. What was that like being at a young age to transition different men coming in? So, yeah, like I was mentioning, it was in, instability, you don't necessarily. I mean, my mom was a very classy lady. Of course, she didn't have like strange men in our house. You know, Christian family, even my grandfather was a deacon. So it's like, that, that that wasn't my story. This ain't no, you know, house was running in and out of, this ain't that. But um, by the time my mom got to, I would say her last marriage, I would say, like I said, the third time's charm. My stepdad um, was a minister, upstanding man, um, and had the unfortunate displeasure of being a former English teacher. So every day after school, he was introduced in my life, maybe about 11, 12, um, every day after school, I would have to uh, write 20 words in a dictionary, write the definition out, and then use it, write it in the sentence to use it. Every day before I could go outside and play. This is after I did my homework, after I got out of school. And so as a result, you know, I can articulate a little bit better. But um, I feel like that absence 
kind of maybe appreciate the presence a little bit better. Um, but of course, being a teenager, not all the time. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I'm gonna switch. I'm gonna switch gears with you here for a second. What about your siblings? You have brothers and sisters. Did they have the same mindset? Like, hey, let's not follow dad and let's you know dedicate our lives to something other than or what, what was their what was their experience? I mean, do you guys even talk about it? Like, uh, so yeah, we all have different relationships with our father. To be quite transparent with you, um, mm -hmm. I would say I've made it a priority to do that. Uh, my siblings not necessarily so much they feel like i did like hey you chose to be in my life or chose not to be in my life as a child i as an adult had the ability to either choose to allow you to be in my life or choose not so that's up to the individual if they feel like they need to have that connection and sure and what, what was it like in terms of school like to have the, these changes within your father being locked up, you know, your mom getting remarried uh, two times after that uh, for the third time to be a charm. What was childhood like? Were you a good kid, bad kid in school? Did you get in trouble? Uh, any girlfriends? Did you date any girls, um, you know, growing up? What were those relationships like with girls? You know, you know, you didn't have that your father, but maybe your biological father as he was locked up, but maybe the other man may have coached you through like girls. Like, how did you deal with that? Ask him if he had any Mexican friends, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fooling, all right. Fooling. It's almost so, like, never mind. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jay. <laughs> so, I, I really have a huge debt of gratitude. Of course, any person would say this, but even much more. I had a driven mother. Like, my mom pushed me. I remember explicitly her asking me what I wanted to be when I was young, second grade, third grade. Like, and you're gonna do it. And I, I was always ambitious. Like I wanted to be president by second grade. I wanted to be what we found out in school. I love dinosaurs. I wanted to be a paleontologist. So my mom bought me like this little excavating kit that allowed me to dig up some bones. It was crazy. I was like on a different like planet. If I wanted to be a meteorologist because I love tornadoes, my mom would buy me all the tornado books and, and just really encouraged my interest. So I think having that loving atmosphere is what really pushed me. Uh, in, in a more positive direction is what I would say. So again, I owe a huge, huge debt of gratitude uh, to my mom and as a result, I am, and the decision that she made, I am as, as well off as I am now. So uh, I'm grateful. Um, concerning like the, the men in my life or my stepdad who pushed me into uh, relations, I did have girlfriends <laughs> growing up. That was, that was, uh, that was a time and experience because I always, I always knew, like I was never really attracted to females. And I, I kind of did it for the veneer or the accoutrement of looking to be heteronormative. Um, and or I just simply liked you as an individual and thought like, hey, I could really get by on this. So, yeah, I remember having some girlfriends in, uh, in high school. It never really like it was never really a physical thing. It was like, uh, well, we can hold hands, I guess, and maybe <laughs> and yeah. maybe made out a couple of times. But outside of that, it wasn't like. Yeah. What did you go to high school? Did you stay in the city for, for high school? Went to three different high schools, bro. Um, Michigan Technical Academy, or MTA. Um, went to U Prep in Detroit, uh, downtown, midtown. Uh, and I graduated from Annapolis out in Dearborn. Okay, that's how, yeah, that's how they do it. But what about your extracurriculars in school? I mean, you have all this life going on around you with your father being locked up and the presence of, you know, the hood, right? But then you also have this presence of uh, good and sort of dedication through your stepfather. What? How did that uh, sort of come into play with your extracurriculars? Did you even have time to consider sports or, I don't know, art or whatever your hobbies may be? Or uh, yes, uh, yeah, they were encouraged. So I never really like was into sports, I, <laughs> period. I wasn't okay. running no ball, I wasn't shooting no hoops. I can't jump. Not all black men can jump, period. So like, <laughs> that was not me, period. But I'm pretty tall, but everybody assumed, but not. But I was pretty encouraged to like operate other interests. I could sing a little bit. I play piano, I play guitar. So, um, you know, I, all those was encouraged. My mom bought me instruments and stuff. So uh, even to this day, I, I keep that up. I had a really, really strong, like I mentioned, background in the church. That really kept me uh, active. It kept me busy. It kept, uh, bro. I mean, when your parents are ministers, bro, like you are in church, bro. Like every night, Wednesday night Bible study, Tuesday night prayer, 
what? Friday night, youth night, Saturday night, choir rehearsal, Wednesday church or Sunday church. Period. You, you and that boy. So um, that really kept a lot of the some of the trouble away. A lot of the other trouble was found in church. So that's another story. Before we go on to Michael's question, I want to ask you, because um, I actually come from a, uh, an apostolic background as well. Oh, um, man. Growing up, uh, did I'm you... Sorry, did you say apostolic? Because nothing... Um, Michael, Michael, it's my turn. It's okay. my turn. No, I was, just, I, was just, I was just clarifying what you said. Oh, no, he went go down ahead. in Jesus' name. Right. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. Thank you. In Jesus' this name. This is always on play. Listen, Listen, Michael. My, Michael's always getting on me because of my beard, talking, talking junk. But uh, at least my hair is not running. At least my hair is not running away from my face, Michael. Get some of that up here. Mm. Anyway, JD, back to you. Oh, it will um, never run far. But go ahead. For those of you, for those of you watching at home who may not know, um, uh, JD keeps speaking about his parents and and the church and growing up in church, and he just made a a, a really good point. For me, growing up, when I was uh, when I was, as you said, uh, in youth service, when I, was, when I would go to youth group, I actually went out uh, in Livonia um, to youth service. We would go to this thing called HYC, Holiday Youth Convention. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, maybe not, but can you speak on that sort of growing up with other teens, um, youth who are also in the church who may come from different backgrounds? Because that was my experience. You know, I'm Mexican. There are some Christian apostolics in in in, um, in in Michigan, right? Not too many. So, can you talk about sort of you know again? You come from a background, a very 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 I would say different background than what a lot of people are used to. But here you are finding yourself in the church, and you are dedicated to the church. So, can you speak about what it was like growing up around other maybe youth who are also in the church? That was an experience. Um, so it's important to have a support group or at least a group of people that you could like relate to, at least have the same or common language in. Um, and I think that's what really the church provided for me. Um, there was a lot of great people that I got to meet from all backgrounds of life. So I went to a pretty sizable church growing up um, and I had friends whose parents were executives, um, friends whose parents were, you know, living in a car. So you have all sorts of people from all sorts of life and they all have different stories. They have the ability to come together and have that commonality and that support. And to say, when I see you, I don't necessarily see what your socioeconomic status, status is, but I see you as a person. And if you're doing it right, if you're going to your local church or your mosque or, you know, however it is that you connect to whatever's sacred to you, um, you need that love and that support and atmosphere of no judgment um and in some areas that it's really doing well and some churches that are really doing well with, with acceptance others a lot of work a lot of work but i i do think a community um and a support group is really important that's what the church really pro provides for me so when when you're your most how well first of all let me rephrase the question how's your relationship with who your mom is currently related, uh, currently married to? What is your relationship with him? Well, um, thank you for the question. Um, it was complex growing up. So I will preface this by saying, unfortunately, uh, my stepdad passed um, a couple years ago. Um, he had pulmonary issues um, and he had succumbed to those, um, to that illness. So, um, it was complex growing up, I will say. Um, I always thought in the back of my mind, like, you're raising another man's child, or I have to call another man father. So there was a bit of animosity in that regard. But um, as you grow up, you say, hey, this guy actually cares. What man do you know? What black man do you know as about to marry a woman with four kids and, like, love them and give and support and you know, ten, no, no, no other person was doing that. So once I kind of put, you know, humble myself a little bit, it's just like you learn to appreciate, it, you know. And even now he's gone, even much more so. Like conversations that we've had, just remembering them, it's just like, man, I was uh, a teenager, bro. I was a teenager, man. Right? So while but he was alive, you guys had a close relationship. It was tumultuous. It was like there was some ups and downs, ebbs and flows. 
Um, I feel like uh, I like with your parents. I mean, natural born. I mean, you, you know that they love you, but especially in them teenage years, you're just like, I can't stand you right now, bro. <laughs> like, and that's a, that's a good point JD brings up. So this leads me into another question. Um, I, I don't. I hope I'm not talking too much. Um, but what is one thing that you remember? Because I, I'm sure we all go through this. Everybody right here on screen can relate to this. But I want to ask you, JD, what is one thing you remember from your pops or your father, right? The man that raised you. Um, that back when you were a teenager, you were like, man, like you said, I can't stand you. Stop talking my ear off about this. Just leave me alone. But nowadays you're sitting there like, man, he was right. What is one thing he left you with that back then maybe you didn't understand, but right now it resonates in your head? Uh, my dad was a hardworking man. Um, he was an entrepreneur um, that really got me started in, in the vein of entrepreneurship that I'm in now. Um, he he really got my start into into housing. So um, if, for those that don't know, I do own my own mortgage brokerage uh, called JD Financial here in the state of Michigan, Florida, and in Texas. And um, he was really the person that exposed me to um, property management. He owned his own property management company with two partners. Um, and it really got me to start to see like how do you um, upkeep the importance of labor, the importance of like hard work is one of the things that he really drove home for me. And of course, at the time, I've, I've never been, like I said, the sports guy, the outdoorsy type. So you telling me to go cut some grass or you telling me to go cut some trees down, you telling me to go operate outside of my element or you telling me to go, ooh, mercy, um, write some stuff. All right, we're not gonna get emotional. I'm um, telling me to, you know, write some things, uh, some words down in out of the dictionary, so it shows that you're trying to grow and nurture, and really, you know, set up you to be a real man. So, well, those, that I mean, that's a lot to take in in general. Um, all the things that you've been through and, and had to experience, and, and growing up in Detroit, and you know, <clears throat> I, I would hate to to bring it up, but you know. Like I said before, to be a black man and have to live life either without your father or with your father being in prison, as many, many black men do, how do you feel your race has played a role inside of your life? Have you had any kind of like significant drawback um, from being black uh, or from being uh, the son of uh, parents that are pastors in the church like has race or religion played a negative effect and or even a positive effect in your life so uh it was a double-edged sword for me growing up so when my mom initially married my stepdad they he whisked us off to mount clement so um i stayed out there for maybe two years and i was of course kicking and screaming the whole way. Like you've taken me out to, you know, a place that I don't know. Um, people that don't look like me, the only black man in this entire middle school, high school period. Like, well, I don't like. So um, it, it really started um, ethnically for me as like animosity. I mean, my atmosphere, everything was opposed to being black. So I didn't want to associate myself with anything associated with being black. I didn't want to be the stereotypical black guy if you feel like I didn't want to, you know, anything associated with culture. It was just like shunned in the area. So as a result, I, I kind of did sh sh shied away from it. But it wasn't really until my college years that I really get an understanding like, yo, this is why there has been such animosity or this is a why there is colorism or this is why all of these things are why are you being followed <laughs> like it wasn't being in detroit being and surrounded from nothing but black people you don't necessarily think of race or, or color or anything like that because it's just your kindred it's your it's your family but i mean sometimes i mean you're in detroit bro you gotta watch your back period but um at the same time if you if you go outside of your your culture and your norm it's on top of that suspicion it's oh all of these assumptions that i have about this man because he's black so initially it was a lot of pushback but then it's like i'm unapologetically black now like i will go head up toe to toe with anybody get at me 
and I've had some pushback even when I was in the corporate office. Um, I've been um, a refinance banker in over 18 states for some of the largest lenders in the country, um, been an account executive over different brokerages. So it's like you, you start to see and hear that even um, in corporate America, the, that, that stigma. So it's, it's good to face it head on. It's good to address it. It's good to point out the pink elephant in the room. So um, I, I, I love it. I embrace it. I am unapologetically black. Well, I, I just asked that question because I just feel like there's so many roadblocks. I mean, race plays such a huge factor inside of um, a lot of people's story, where they come from. And in your case, you're dealing with race, religion, which are two big things um, as topics that people have so many different harsh opinions about aside from politics let's not even go there um so just to ask how you know be a black man in detroit and dealing with these kinds of obstacles already with a, a, a kind of hectic life uh you know growing up and dealing with everything that you dealt with um so i think that this is a good starting point i think that we really delved into getting to know jay davis inside of this first episode and i'm looking forward to jumping into episode two where we're going to learn more about your story uh i just want to remind everybody that's watching at home please don't forget to like comment and subscribe hit that bell do all that jazz we're trying to get our viewership up we're trying to make sure that we get a lot of people tuning in and kind of listening because for me there's I would say it's humbling to hear other people's stories and what they go through because we all people don't really value where they're at and some people have gone through worse things or experienced worse and, and people just need to be humble because they're they're all they don't even know or think about the crazy shit that other people kind of endure and i think that that's the beautiful thing of the story of so please don't forget to like comment subscribe for all those that are viewing in jay davis thank you for uh for telling us your long story uh inside of the small amount of time and manny thanks for keeping it small in a small amount of time uh i want to thank everybody else for tuning in yep 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 we just just head on out uh and as always we will talk to everybody next week